I'd like to welcome the local custodians of the land on which we meet today and honour elders past, present and emerging. Good morning and welcome to the Aged Care COVID vaccine update. Um, our presenters for today are Catherine Turner, the Exec Manager with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network and Hannah Lane, our Project Officer at the PHN. Just some housekeeping I'm gonna run through. Um, today is being recorded, you will be able to watch it and the presentation will be available on our education library on our website. Um, there will be a poll that will turn up at the end. This is for evaluation purposes and we really value your input. So I encourage you strongly to complete that so that we can keep um, delivering education that's relative and current for you. Uh, encourage you to also ask questions today. Um, that's really part of the interactive component of this session. So we would love you to utilise the question box. There is also a chat box as well. Um, and if we don't get to your questions, we'll endeavour to get to those later um, and respond to you by email. Or you can always email us on education at hnaccphn.com.au. I'll now hand over to Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks for that, Mel. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Aboriginal land today, wherever we are across the region, and acknowledge Elders past and present. Oh, Hannah's giving me a message here about my screen, which I... Sorry, and no, I was doing so well. Hang on. That screen looks good for my end, Catherine. Thank you. Um, sorry, yes, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Aboriginal land today and acknowledge the ongoing custodianship of the Aboriginal people um, for this beautiful country and thank them for the care that they take um, of us. So I'd also really like to acknowledge all of you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us at relatively short notice again um, for this update and thanks for the work that you're doing to keep our people safe. Um, I don't think any of us can um, fathom the, the challenges that the last 12 months have created for us all. And, uh, you know, we, we're we very pleased um, to be able to provide a little bit more information. Um, we also want to really acknowledge that the information has been coming very slowly um, from the department. Uh, and I'm sure you're getting it from lots of different sources. So we definitely don't want to be uh, complicating anything. Um, I believe that the reason that this is all coming so slowly from the department is the risk of misinformation and trying to make sure that we have everybody uh, getting the correct information as they as they re, as they need it, which makes it no less um, challenging for you all. So uh, the Primary Health Network has been asked to reach out uh, locally and offer support to local residential aged care facilities and the GPs. Uh, we also will have a reporting function um, back to the department to try and assist with this vaccine rollout, uh, which is one of the reasons we want to speak to you again today about Capacity Tracker. Um, we're also working very closely with our local health district colleagues on their plans um, for vaccination and having them to be ready to assist with issues as they arise uh, in the vaccine rollout um, that's being led by the Commonwealth in the aged care facilities and uh, GP world. Look, we've got lots of questions already. Uh, some can be answered in the guidance documents from the department, but there's still plenty that that we 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 don't have the answers to. And but we do, we are hoping to be able to funnel all of your questions to either Healthcare Australia or the Department of Health. We've got meetings with both of them tomorrow, um, and keep the information flowing out to you and your colleagues. So that's why uh, questions, all the questions that you put into the question box here will be um, collated and we're looking at ways we can uh, store them in a place where you can go back to them and add to our frequently asked question uh, list. Uh, finally, the other thing I just want to talk to, speak to before we get into this is um, Kimberly Booth, who's uh, been working here at the Primary Health Network for quite a number of years, has uh, been moved into a role to lead all of our COVID-19 uh, response um, and so Kimberly will be uh, a key contact person uh, with the vaccine for the vaccine rollout specifically with the GPs but somebody who's also going to be doing a lot of work and who you'll undoubtedly hear from over time and Kim's on the call today pen poised to capture questions as well so what do we know so far um, we know that there is a uh, vaccine that's been um, provided by Pfizer, which is 
arrived in the country with a rollout to the priority groups, uh, which will commence mid to late January, and we know that some of that rollout will actually commence next week. There is also the development of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was approved yesterday, the day before, uh, and that rollout will con commence um, imminently, shortly, don't really have an answer for that one. And we know there are other vaccines that are likely to be available later in the year. Uh, what we also know is that here in Australia, we're in a very blessed position of being able to, uh, not having COVID run rampant through the community and being able to take our time to get this uh, rollout uh, delivered in a less hectic fashion than many of our colleagues overseas. So what do we know so far? We know that Healthcare Australia has been announced as the in-reach workforce contractor for facilities, aged care facilities in New South Wales and Queensland. We know that Aspen Medical are looking after the rest of the country. Uh, we, met, we meet with the department twice weekly um, around all things COVID and um, lately it's been just about all things uh, vaccine related. And as I said, we're meeting with Healthcare Australia tomorrow with all of the New South Wales uh, PHNs to talk about what their plans are and to get at least some of those questions answered. We know that seven residential aged care facilities on the Central Coast have been identified as the first to receive vaccines. Uh, we were informed a few days ago that those facilities already knew who they were, but um, yesterday when one of our team met with them, they actually haven't been contacted yet by Healthcare Australia, or they hadn't been, um, to, let, to be told uh, exactly what day they were coming. So, you know, this is, um, remains really challenging, but I'm sure Healthcare Australia are going as fast as they possibly can as well. So the facilities have been notified by the department that they're, um, when the week, the, the first seven, uh, they at least know that it's next week, but unless something's changed overnight, I'm not sure they know when exactly that is. And I'm hoping that they already do. So what do we know about um, what residential aged care facilities uh, will be doing in preparation? Um, you will be advised of the vaccination date. Now, when we met with the department the other day, they suggested that they would be able to tell you what week uh, people would be coming um, as soon as possible. So we're really hoping that potentially by the end of this week, that's crossing fingers, um, that you will know at least the the week that people will be coming and then hopefully the date. Uh, there will be little room for changing or amending vaccination timetables. In fact, I doubt there'll be very much at all. We know that the consents of the residents will be the responsibility of the aged care facilities and their usual GPs. And we know that there'll be conversations that are needed to be had around clinical appropriateness of, of um, consenting people. Uh, we know there is a consent template that's been developed and it's available in the toolkit. And I'll, if you haven't already perused that, I've got a link for that here on the website. We know that the aged care facilities will be asked to nominate a registered nurse who will be the clinical lead um, for the vaccination program and the main contact with Healthcare Australia. Facilities will be responsible for communicating with the residents, with the family and their staff and other in-scope visitors in relation to the vaccine program arrangements. And in-scope visitors include uh, contractors who visit regularly. Uh, they would be um, GPs, uh, age, um, allied health providers and others. Um, and I think there's some guidance on that in the documents, but I'm sure there'll be lots of discussions to be had about exactly who is in-scope further down the track. We know that Healthcare Australia will bring everything that's required, uh, including all consumables. Uh, we know that you'll need to provide an appropriate space for the vaccinations. Um, and the guiding templates, documents, all the guidelines have been made available and the links are at the end of this presentation. And if one of the organisers could perhaps pop that link in the question box, that would be useful in case anybody wants to read ahead. So what will the Primary Health Network be doing? Uh, well, we'll be continuing to support communication between the workforce contractor and the aged care facilities and assisting them to plan their delivery schedule based on local regional knowledge. So fortunately, um, over the last 12 months especially, we've developed a much uh, clearer understanding of where facilities are, how many uh, people are in them and how easy or difficult it's gonna be for Healthcare Australia to get um, through a number of facilities on a particular day. So we'll continue to uh, 
um, communicate with them. Um, Healthcare Australia will work with the Primary Health Network contact on the schedule um, in each region and we're very aware the facilities will require at least two visits and for a whole lot of reasons um, more than two visits. Um, so we're uh, also being asked to act as a key communication and liaison point um, for the aged care facilities for the vaccination program and we'll partner with the Australian Government to progress the rollout of the vaccination program for phase 1A um, which affects all residential aged care residents and staff. So I'll just pause there, um, we'll open up for questions at the end of the presentation but um, I'm going to now hand over to my colleague Hannah Lane and ask Hannah to walk us through some of the um, supports that we're providing uh, via the capacity tracker and um, take you through a few more slides and then Hannah will pass back to me for the question section. Thanks Hannah. Thanks Catherine. I just need to show my screen apparently so just give me one moment. Okay. Are you able to see my slide there? We can, but it's not in presentation mode unless I'm still screen. Okay. It should be in presentation mode. Anyway, um, I think I might have to go with that at this point in time. Um, because I have clicked the presentation mode box. So, um, unless maybe what I'll do is just make it. It's showing all of your screens, Hannah, not just the. Sorry, I'll just. That's okay. Apologies, Try. everyone. We're getting used to a whole lot of different, uh, different uh, platforms. Yeah. That's, that's probably better. A single slide now? We can. Wonderful. All right, thank you and apologies everyone. Um, so I'm talking about Capacity Tracker, which is a free online tool that the PHN um, provides, which enables RACFs to communicate directly with us about their operational status and any issues that they are experiencing. So we are currently developing an additional functionality, a vaccination module, that will enable um, facilities to tell us the number of residents and staff who have been vaccinated, um, some information about um, their status operationally and any other issues that they might want to share with us. So this information will be used to assist with the schedule planning as um, Catherine has already referred to. And um, one of the most important things is that um, each facility is able to activate an alert if there is any issue with vaccination levels. And that will um, basically trigger a response from the PHN to come and provide whatever support we can um, provide. Um, so as an example, um, actually no, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, the vaccination module will be available in hopefully the next week or so. We are currently working um, with the developers to finalise that. And obviously once it's um, rolled out, we'll be um, providing training and guidance as well. So um, this gives you a little um, view of one of the screens. It's still in development, but you see um, on the left side would be all the names of each residential aged care facility. Um, obviously that's a view that we are able to see, you will each only be able to see your own um, as your settings allow. But what you'll see there is that you'll have a new um, vaccinations option. And when you click on that, you'll be taken to this vaccines menu essentially, which um, enables you to provide updates on which particular vaccine is being um, administered and your, um, which one you're updating. So if we select COVID, um, we'll, give um, a vaccination operation status. So that might um, be indicating that there's no problems with vaccination status at the moment, or it could be um, saying there's some problems or problems imminent or, or, or potential problems that you can foresee that might indicate an amber alert is required, 
or red might be in a situation where you're experiencing um, issues right at that time. So as an example, um, this, just to let you know, at this point, this form has been developed for both um, residential aged care facilities and GP use. So we're being careful about um, which one um, or, or which, uh, which organisations will require each field um, and they're yet to be split out. But there are situations where although a residential aged care facility isn't itself administering vaccinations, they might have a red alert. For example, if they're booked in and they're expecting all their residents to be um, vaccinated on the nominated day and then for some reason the provider doesn't turn up or inadequate supplies are brought with them or um, something, you know, the person, uh, the immuniser is sick, for example. So even though you are not um, yourselves administering the vaccination, there might be a reason that you want to raise an alert with us and you can give the reasons um, underneath that. And if there's another reason that's not listed, you might want to um, indicate what the problem is so that when we get the alert, we can um, mm -hmm. find out what we can do in response to that and how we can provide support. Um, here we see a screen where we're looking at the number of vaccinations given, and you can see that we're looking at first dose and both doses. Um, and the proportions of those um, also looking at uh, whether we track and how we track the declines um, and which information needs to be broken down by vaccine type um, or maker, I suppose, is a better reference. Um, and other information that might be just gathered at the, at the vaccine level, such as um, COVID. So these are the things that we're just finalising um, at this point in time. What that means for you is that um, it's really important that the contact details of your site managers are kept current and accurate. So please notify us if, if you have any changes to any of those details, names, um, contact numbers and so on. Um, that helps keep, keep our systems up to date. And that also means that when you register for Capacity Tracker, if you haven't already, um, the registration goes very smoothly as we can quickly validate those details. Um, the second point is if you're not registered for Capacity Tracker, this is really an essential tool. Um, we, we can respond most helpfully if, if everybody uses this tool to share with us um, their status and any changes to that. Um, the link there, um, au.capacitytracker.com is the URL for the site and you can go directly there to register or Below you see Ellen Minel's contact details. She is um, coordinating the registration and onboarding for residential aged care facilities onto Capacity Tracker and her details are there. So if you're not yet registered, please um, be in contact with Ellen who can walk through in more detail um, what this means for you. And I'll hand back to Catherine now. Thanks, Hannah. And um just best, uh, sharing. Lovely, and I'll try to share again. You'd think after a year we'd all be getting better at this, so apologies. Uh, can anyone see my screen now? Yep, looks Thank good. You. Thank you. So, in summary, uh, we acknowledge that there is going to need to be a fast turnaround for consent. Um, if I was a gambling person, I would suggest that it appears that Healthcare Australia will start closer to Sydney and work their way out, but I would not be making, basing any planning on that. Um, we uh, obviously, and I'm sure you're all doing this, um, you need to continue to provide adequate information um, as best you can, including um, to your regular uh, contract visiting contractors, um, provide an appropriate physical space, and there is information in the guidelines about what that looks like. Um, make sure that everybody's there on the vaccination day. Keep in touch with us, as, um, as Hannah's just said. Um, look, I understand everybody has other uh, communication channels, but at the moment, the Department of Health um, has 
decided that they're going to communicate through us with lots of things. So we will be able to hopefully get you fairly quick response to a question if there is one that's been, if the answer's already been determined. And we would, yeah, really encourage you to register for Capacity Tracker and keep your data up to date. Uh, we know there have been some um, uh, groups who are not um, in favour of uh, registra registering in that tool. Um, so if, if there is something we can do or we need to meet with somebody to uh, answer any questions or concerns people have, please just um, get in touch with us and, and I'll make sure that either myself or our CEO can uh, meet with people if that's what's required. So we think this is going to be the best. Um, so just to let you know too, uh, I think there are now four or five other primary health networks in Australia who are live with Capacity Tracker and many others who are looking at it. So hopefully that will make that a bit easier. Uh, the link to the toolkit. Uh, yesterday we were talking about this and thinking, well, we'd like to see it and it magically appeared on the website. Um, I imagine it will be regularly updated. Um, so it's also not easy to find on the website, so I'd really recommend you bookmark it. Um, and uh, yeah, everything that you need to know is there. So questions. Um, as I said, now there's a heap here. I'm going to run through some of them, noting that helpfully a couple of people have already answered them. And I'm going to squint because I don't have my glasses, sorry. So are GPs and other health providers included in staff? Yes, if they visit the facility. So um, obviously you will have to make your best effort to let them know when the vaccination date for staff is. Um, could you please clarify the role of the GP in obtaining consent? Um, it is in the toolkit. Uh, there have been some questions around exactly what that means and we think primarily that role is going to be around determining clinical appropriateness uh, for the residents and continuing to give information to the residents and the families in the same way they do for other vaccinations. Um, oh and thanks Liz. So some of the facilities in the Central West are being uh, immunised next week. Um, we, uh, well, yeah, we know this, the first, oh, I know where all the first weeks are um, across the country and we're hoping that, um, and there are quite a number in New South Wales, and we're hoping that uh, any day now we'll get the rest of the list, um, noting it's going to change. So I can see their concern for putting out information uh, too quickly, but it would be really helpful. Um, hello, Chris Giles. Has there been information or conversations about home care consumers, will these be liaising with the general with their GP? Yes. So people who live outside of residential and disability, um, residential aged or disability services will be uh, part of the rollout um, with their GP. And more information is coming uh, about that. Uh, so currently, yes, they'll be working with their GPs on what that looks like. I hope that answers that. How do facilities get new residents and staff vaccinated after that arrive after the first dose? We've had a similar question about if people are in there for respite, um, are they vaccinated at the time and how do you get them back a second time? So um, we're seeking further clarification. I assume Healthcare Australia have a plan for this and I would, you know, they're going to have to come back twice and there is also going to need to be uh, the government even talks in the phasing of um, you know another round of vaccinations to pick up people who've been missed in the past. So um, hopefully we'll get some more information precisely about that. Uh, if you have capacity tracker, yes, you'll automatically get the vaccination module. We are in user access testing right now and uh, we hope that'll be live, I'm going to say next week. Uh, could you please put the toolkit slide back up? Yes, I can definitely do that. Hang on. There you go. That was easy. Um, I think Susan too, if you just search vaccine aged care readiness toolkit, hopefully that will pop up for you. Regarding respite consumers, we'll be vaccinating them. So that's, um, as I said, that's one of the questions I have as well. The consent form template is in the toolkit. Um, the consent form template is in the toolkit. Uh, we also have a link there for a webinar that OPAN are running. 
um, which is on informed consent um, for, for residents and families. So that might be something worth having a look at and seeing if there's some information in that that might be helpful, particularly for you if you're having challenging discussions um, with families or if families just want to know more about this or carers or the residents themselves. Why are they rolling this out differently to flu vax? Why can't we vaccinate our residents ourselves? Uh, there's a whole lot of answers to that question. Um, some of them are around uh, the training that's required. This is a new vaccine. It's um, it has uh, the storage elements are the probably the most practical problem. Um, we just don't have around the country enough um, capacity to manage to store the the Pfizer vaccine at the level, the temperature that it's required. Um, because it's a multi-use vial, it's different to the normal um, flu vax uh, as well. So there is some training that's required for people with that. Um, yeah, and so while it's an enormously challenging uh, question, they're, they're the answers. So um, anybody who is delivering any of the new vaccines needs to um, complete training and be updated um, specifically on the um, issues related to this one. Um, but yeah, the, I think the storage is the the real real issue and this is going to be a huge problem um, for everybody who's required to manage the Pfizer vaccine um, around the world. It's been a problem um, and uh, yeah hopefully Robert that answers that question. Catherine well, and Erica can I, can I just yes, add please. something in? Yes. Um, also what? there's there's a clinical recommendation that there's at least two weeks between the doses of the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine as well. So um, that also adds to the, I guess, the complexity of this. So just keep that in mind in terms of um, in not having the vaccine um, closer than two weeks apart. Thank you. Yeah, the complexity of, and where, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, dealing with this in a different way to lots of people in that we are likely to have to, there will be, um, you will have to stage this around the flu vax as well. And we have no information yet about flu vax or when it's available. So we're just presuming that it will be um, a similar process. We're hoping that um, we don't have to do quite as much uh, calling and contacting as we did last year with the flu vac supply. Um, and that's another reason that we've implemented the capacity tracker to try and just do that um, quickly through that. Uh, will regular family carers who come in daily be able to be vaccinated? That's a tricky question and one I'm not completely sure about. So I will pose that uh, to Healthcare Australia and ask how they're, they're planning to deal with that. Well, residents need to be isolated. Should they, oh yeah, should they develop symptoms as per normal infection procedures? I asked this question yesterday of one of our um, public health physicians and we're definitely gonna need that information. Uh, we do know that um, many people develop uh, sort of cold-like symptoms after the vaccine. And um, you know, the question is, do they need to be isolated and swabbed? Um, so, uh, when we did ask the question the other day, the department said yes, but um, we just want to find that out um, directly. So Alison, um, that's definitely a question that we'll put on the frequently asked question list. And the following question is exactly the same. So I would presume um, that we will need to treat them uh, as if they are potentially COVID positive, but please don't take that one. I, I, need, I don't have a clear answer on that. Um, oh, I've lost track of the questions. Wait a minute. Sorry. Um, are staff and residents being vaccinated at the same time? There's a few questions there about that. Originally, that was the information that we received. I'm not sure if anyone's on the line who's um, received any more up-to-date information who are part of the first week's rollout. But the information we got from the department last week was that they would only be doing residents in the first couple of weeks. Um, they will be coming back to do to do the staff. So that's a change um, from the information that we've received. And I will need to continue to work on trying to get some clarity on that from you. Um, are you able to begin the consent form process right now? Absolutely. So absolutely. 
um, you, you could make a start on that. Um, the, the more you get, the sooner this is going to take obviously some time if you need to coordinate with GP visits and consultation with family. So yes, um, please make that as, uh, get that done. Um, start as soon as you're ready, Erin. Um, can volunteers be included with staff? I uh, believe the answer is yes. Uh, however, we will definitely clarify that um, information and I, I know you'll be asked to provide a list um, to Healthcare Australia of who exactly is included in your in your um, uh, team um, for vaccination. Um, how am I going? I've reordered my questions, which is not helpful. So. Oh, I've got one thanks, you, Catherine. Oh, sorry. That's okay. So <laughs> Deirdre is helpfully, helpfully added in here that, uh, yes, they've been told that there are only um, residents being vaccinated next week um, at this stage. And I suspect that's a supply issue, to be honest, um, and, a, and a risk situation. Sorry, Mel, are there others you want to pose? Uh, yes, yeah, a couple more have come through. So after the vaccine, will staff be able to work uh, if, if they're displaying symptoms of the cold after being vaccinated? It's an interesting one. It is an interesting one and one um, we're going to seek some clarification on. Sure. And that's one that local health districts are asking as well because as they vaccinate, you know, all of their frontline staff, uh, if they need they need to isolate them, this is going to become very challenging to run an emergency department or intensive care unit or an aged care facility. There's also a couple of questions about the slides and yes, they will be available on our website in our education library after the presentation. Yep. Uh, which vaccine will the staff be receiving? Uh, again, um, our initial information was that they will be receiving the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we haven't heard that that's changed, um, but we also haven't uh, seen a start date for that. So. Corinne, um, that's a question we will continue to, to ask and it's on our list to um, have the conversation tomorrow. Are there any other questions? How long will a consent form last? That's that's me blanking there. Um, I haven't, Erica or Jackie, I'm not sure if you've got the detail and can answer that question. It's Jackie Kath. Um, I have no specific um, information around how long it will last, but I would assume the same as for flu vax consent uh, until yeah. it's um, until it's given until all the it's completed. Completed. Yeah, yeah, until the two doses delivered. are delivered. Yeah. We Correct. Would That's how I would assume that that would be. Yeah. Thanks, Erica. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was another question here. Um, uh, in terms of suitability for the vaccine, uh, is there a guide? Hello, Jill says. Um, well, it's a discussion with the GP. And uh, we will find out exactly what that discussion should uh, include with the information we're hoping is coming to the GPs, Jill. So we'll we'll um, find that for you. Uh, the conversations we've been having with the department are more about this, the conversation you would have re anyway with people who, whether there are end of life issues to be taken into account or clinical, su clinical suitability. So whether the resident is actually well enough to receive an additional um, challenge physically. Um, but uh, I know there is some information that's been made available. We've also um, looking to run with the other New South Wales PHNs um, a session specifically for GPs about the residential aged care uh, rollout, and that'll be one night next week. So um, um, if that's, I hope that's helpful, noting that um, for some people this conversation needs to be having now, so that is um, going to be a bit challenging. Uh, if you're already involved with people who are needing to be vaccinated next week. Um, Mel, can you um, go through any of the later questions that have come in? Oh, can a nurse practitioner administer the vaccine 
in the aged care facility? No, the only people that can at this stage register the, administer the vaccine are employees of Healthcare Australia who've been designated approved um, immunisers. So again, different. Um, I suppose in one way it means that uh, you can concentrate on the flu vax rollout, but no, that um, the only people that will be administering the vaccine, as far as we know, uh, right now are coming from Healthcare Australia because they're bringing the vaccines with them. Okay, we have one about agency staff. Um, will they be vaccinated and included? Again, I would say yes, but we'll get that clarified. And I guess this is another one that will need clarifying is will staff be vaccinated on the same day? Well, I've already clarified that, Mel. So we, 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 we were told yes, but for the first round, that's not happening. So we're just not really sure. Okay. Will they vaccinate at the bedside for our bedridden residents? Uh, Erica or Jackie, do you have the answer to that one? No, I don't. Uh, the, the toolkit just talks about suitable space. Um, I'm assuming that, and this is an assumption, that if they cannot be taken to a suitable space, then then the vaccinator, the, the immuniser, will go to Muhammad, basically. <laughs> so um, that's, that's an assumption uh, based on hopefully common sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think part of the suitable space is about timing and able, being able to uh, obviously vaccinate at, at pace, um, but also being able to observe people. So um, there'll be some safety issues related to that, but equally there'd be safety issues for trying to move people that are unable to be moved. So thank you. Mm. Mel, any others? Yeah, oh, there is a question here about the nurses. Do the nurses in the facility require special training for the vaccination? Uh, no, they don't. However, uh, there is training available. Um, there are some vaccine uh, modules that are available, which we'll put up a link, we'll send out a link for. Um, whether you're um, going to administer the vaccine or not, but just some information about what you need to look out for and some of those other things. There will obviously be information left by Healthcare Australia, but it would be good and helpful um, to, for people to be able to know what it is that the vaccine's doing, being able to uh, have the conversations with families about how it works and also um, what people need to be looking out for. Um, this one about processing symptoms after the vaccination and just following normal procedure. Will that be the same? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm going to say yes, but we're going to get some clarity around that, noting the practicality of all that. Uh, there's a question here about is verbal consent enough? Um, uh, the response that we've found is it is acceptable. Written consent is obviously very much preferred, but if um, consent to either receive the vaccine or not receive the vaccine is noted in the patient's records, we're told that's enough. So again, as this um, rollout commences and, and happens, we'll know more about how these, these things are being worked through. Frequency, will it be yearly vaccination for aged care? Don't know, don't know. Um, I think at this stage we're, because we're a few months behind um, some of the other countries, we'll obviously be uh, learning about that. Um, you know, only what I'm hearing in the press is we're likely to need a booster. Um, I don't know how often, and I guess it also depends on um, how often the virus mutates and whether we need an entirely different vaccine um, in a year or so. So yeah, we don't know that. Uh, we also don't know, uh, whether if there was a booster that would be delivered at the same time as flu vax or separate. So there's a lot of unknowns here, um, but they're all good questions for us to, to try and explore further. And can someone pass on, on the infection or the COVID after being vaccinated at all? Can you still pass it on? Yeah, this is the big um, the big question and one of the one of the things that's really guiding the rollout around the world. So the answer at the moment is we don't know uh, that people haven't had the vaccine for long enough um, 
to to know whether that's whether the vaccine stops you. We know that the vaccine um, reduces symptoms and reduces the impact on you. Uh, we don't know whether it stops you transferring it to someone else if you um, have been infected. So this is one of the, the big questions that scientists are working on around the world. Yeah, so there's clinical trials um, ongoing at the moment of the vaccine types, looking at transmissibility. Um, so the initial trials that were done were done on disease severity for the person. So that was the first aim. And now that they're sort of, they've achieved that, they're looking at whether transmissibility is reduced. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here, a really practical one from Alison, uh, which says that the residents' wristband will be hole punched after each vaccine. Um, for those who refuse to wear to wear one, and you have few, I'm assuming you'll just have to manage that um, on a case by case basis, and yeah, hole punch the the, the wristband um, in the clinical folder. Uh, we've talked before about um, uh, the the benefit, which may not have been there, may not have been obvious, um, wasn't necessarily in place for wristbands. Um, some time ago and the, the challenges that we know happened at um, some of the facilities where they had a large infection outbreak that infected affected many of the staff and the challenges of um, being able to identify the residents um, without a wristband um, if they were uh, when you're not there. So if you and many of your staff are put into quarantine, the challenges of not having a wristband. So obviously it's encouraged, but um, you know, if you can't make people do things and if that's going to create more issues then yeah find out a process um, that's going to work for you and your facility. In the end you're responsible so you know this the Healthcare Australia or the government or anyone else isn't coming in to um, take away your your role as the, the the carers for these people so and the managers of these facilities so yes there are a whole lot of guidelines related to the vaccine but in the end you're going to make it work for you for your facility the same way as um, you know you do with everything else that you do. So I hope that answers that one. Will residents' uh, relatives still be allowed to visit if they don't have the COVID vaccine, like partners if they're elderly and compromised? Yeah, they'll have to. Um, the vaccine's not compulsory. Um, and the vaccine rollout will take some time. So you know, currently uh, that won't change. Um, is the is the government line on that? Um, so again, uh, it's a bit different to flu vax um, and the response that's been taken to that. Um, but at this stage, because the vaccine isn't compulsory for anybody, um, and that's the approach that they want to take, uh, then yeah, people will still be able to visit. And you'll have to just take the same precautions as you're already taking. Yeah. Uh, there hasn't been a link added to from the AT, AGI advice on the relative time of administering uh, influenza and COVID vaccines. So the link's just been added to the chat box. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here from Danny. Hello. Saying how much notice will you receive regarding your vaccine date? Magic question. So uh, when we talked to the people at the department on Tuesday, they were suggesting that everybody would know the week that people were coming um, soon. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not really able to, to answer that question. So, you know, they're going to say as much notice as they can possibly give, but um, we could talk to our Central Coast colleagues and find out how much information they've had and how soon they've received it. And But again, once Healthcare Australia get themselves established, they will find that out. So look, I'll definitely um, pose that question tomorrow and reiterate how important that's going to be um, for you to get as much information as you can, as early as you can. Okay, so if anyone's got any further questions, they can add it to the question or chat box for us. Hang on, um, Eric, Eric, yep. go, Eric. There's a question there about, um, do we know the long-term effects? I'd suggest um, if you go back and look at 
a webinar that we ran last week, which was for um, our stakeholders that was run by the public health physicians, um, David Derheim and Kat Taylor. Um, have a look at the webinar that's been recorded and the presentation slides, and there's a bit more clinical information in that webinar. And obviously there'll be long-term um, scientific studies on this as well. So it's it's information that's yet to be, I guess, known because we've got to wait for the amount of people to be vaccinated and there will be tracking um, systems in all countries, tracking the side effects, adverse events and so on. So it'll take a while before that data becomes available. Thanks, Erica. And that's a good reminder that um, uh, we've, we've run now I don't know, Mel could tell us how many of these um, conversations with uh, with uh, the clinical experts and others around the region, and um, they're all available. Uh, the information remains current uh, in most of them, and we haven't nothing's moved greatly. Uh, and so, yeah, we're you know, there are they're all there. If you if you saw one and you think I want to go back and check that one out, um, you can do that at any time. All right, Mel's popped back up. Are there any last questions? Now noting that we're not going to, um, uh, you know, close this off. Oh, there's one last question here. As an immuniser, do I get aged care to vaccinate? Daphne, I, I think I might have answered that. So the vaccination in residential aged care residents will be, and staff, we're told, we manage by Healthcare Australia. So uh, you won't be required to provide the COVID-19 vaccine um, in residential aged care, but obviously the flu vaccine and other, other vaccines, other work that you're already doing will continue. Um, and we know that general practice and others are going to need a lot of help as well uh, with immunising the rest of the community. Team, have I missed any questions? I'm looking at this here. I think you've pretty much covered them, them all. Oh, hang well on, there's one more. I'll just, I'll just run through this last question that Chris is in the advocacy forum recently, a discussion related to the rights of residents who consent and there will be other residents and staff who elect not to have the vaccination. This will be the case. Has this been raised within your forums with Department of Health? Yes. So um, we'll, we will follow this one up with a bit more advice for people. Um, as I said, the, the vaccine and the, isn't compulsory around the country, and this is this is um, being challenging around the whole world where people are being vaccinated and others are choosing for a whole lot of reasons not to be. Um, this is going to be a, a challenge that we're going to have going forward, and um, probably you know, also not just with this vaccine, but with others as people um, have more and more conversations about this. Um, yep, we'll definitely add that to the list and uh, see what advice is being made available from the department there. They were working the other day on um, uh, their own frequently asked questions and hopefully that will offer some assistance, but I think it's just gonna be another challenge for people who are uh, managing facilities or uh, community groups um, and, having the right information to be able to have a sensible conversation about it. As I said, as there's no other, I don't have any other questions now, um, we're going to address each of these and put out a bit of a summary so that you can refer back to it later. The ones where we've said we think, but we're not sure, we're going to um, put, you know, to be confirmed. Um, hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to take this list uh, to both the groups we're meeting with tomorrow and we will continue to have those. If it would be helpful, we could run uh, similar sessions on this for you as needed. Um, next week, I know that the ACE meeting, which is available for the Hunter New England um, facilities, will be addressing some of this. And um, I think I'm going to propose that we uh, make that meeting available to everybody who wants to attend so that the information's pretty um, doesn't necessarily relate to where you are, it's um, across the region. So um, if that's the case, we'll send out a link for that to the people who don't normally get that. And we'll be revisiting uh, the information that we have at that meeting next week. Um, and hopefully by then we'll have a little bit of feedback from the facilities who have been part of the first couple of days. And that might give us some more 
um, practical tips for what's that, how this is actually working. So with that, um, oh, Erica, yes? Yep, sorry. I just wanted to add, we're also running a webinar specifically for allied health professionals next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. So if you have staff in your facility, allied health staff, please um, direct them to the PHN website and they're welcome to attend that vaccine um, webinar specifically designed for them. Yep, and if they've got some questions they'd like to have answered, we'd like to have them ahead of time so we can do our best to get those sorted. So without further ado, I thank everybody for their time. I know everyone's really busy and this is making everything so much busier, um, but uh, it does feel like a really positive step in our um, COVID journey. So um, yeah, look, thanks everyone. Thanks to the team for pulling together all this information. Please reach out to us. Um, yeah, I know you've got other people you can reach out to as well, but you know we're here to help and um, we're here to hopefully get some of this information back to you. So thanks very much. Mel, did you want to just plug the evaluation poll? Yeah, so just a quick reminder for everybody that the poll will be coming up at the conclusion of the webinar and we would really like you to complete that so we can get some more feedback to hold further events. Today it has been recorded, as we've said previously, um, and the presentation will also be available in the coming days in our education library on our website. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Catherine Turner. Um, she did an amazing job today with the questions and to the whole team for pulling it together so quickly and responding to the need for this event. So thank you. And thank you to everyone out there for the amazing job you're doing. Um, take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Good afternoon. Bye. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, everyone. Bye.